Welcome to Covenant Community Church here in Vacaville, California. Thank you for joining us. We are so happy that you are with us. Wherever you're at today, please join us in worshiping our King. Darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken I won't be shaken There's so much fear covering our hearts and pain. Jesus will always take care of it. Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall. But you have never failed me yet.
still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never fail me
Good morning, church. As we continue in our time of worship, we're going to enter into a time of prayer to give our thanksgiving and uh, to the Lord and lift our prayers of the, of the church. Um, I came across a verse uh, this week in a devotional, and uh, I thought it, uh, it was fitting um, as we enter into this uh, season with an election looming. And uh, uh, it's 1 Peter chapter 3, starting at verse 8. It says, Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for this, to you, for this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Would you join me in prayer, please? God, we are thankful for your blessings, for your provision, for your love, for all the things that you provide to us. God, as we continue in this, in this time that just feels so odd and so, so disconcerting at times, God, with the, the fires that are still burning and the smoke outside, and, and uh, it, it just it feels unsettled. But God, you are faithful. God, just like even when we can't see the sun shining, we know that it's still there. You too are always there, even if we can't see you. And God, I thank you for that. I thank you that you don't give up on us. I thank you that you always come chasing after us, no matter how far we try to run, no matter how hard we try to push you away, no matter how hard we try to ignore your callings, God, you are faithful, you are everlasting, and you constantly seek us out. God, I thank you for all that you've given us, and we do thank you for what we have, uh, even when times are tough, even when we may not know where our next meal is coming from or our next uh, rent payment. God, you are faithful and you provide, and God, we thank you for that. God, we continue to pray for protection over the students uh, and the teachers and everyone involved in the education system, God, whether people are back meeting in person or learning from a distance or some combination of that, God, we, we pray for safety. God, we pray for health as people uh, are out and about, uh, God, that uh, we know this virus is a risk, but we know that you are bigger than a virus, God, and so while we take precautions and we exercise care, we ultimately, God, lean on you and turn to you for our protection. And uh, we just pray for, for your healing and your protection over this town. God, as I alluded to a moment ago, as we head into this, uh, this election season, God, it can be easy to uh, have disagreements or feel like uh, it's easier to turn people off than to engage. But I was reminded this week, God, by my, my brothers in Christ that we're called to be in community. We're called to come together in your name. We're called to set aside our differences, God. And so I pray that you would help us do that. I pray that you help us find common ground, whether it's in you or, or whatever else it may be in our lives, God, that, that uh, we have so much more in common as, as sons and daughters, brothers and sisters in Christ than... Um, than, than what would keep to, uh, seek to keep us apart. So God, I pray that you bring us together. I pray that you give us soft hearts. I pray that you give us understanding. I pray that you, you help us listen more, maybe speak less. And uh, as you say, be, be slow to anger. Um, and, and, and God, that, that we would have grace towards those around us just as you give us grace. God, we continue to look forward to a time that we can get back together in person, but until that time, we thank you for the ability to, to worship apart. And God, we thank you for this building that we can still come to and worship. Um, we thank you for, for the homes or the cars or wherever it may be, God, that people are, are, are watching and listening, um, that we can still worship you and that we have the freedom to do that. God, as we continue in the surface, I pray especially for Pastor Julia that, that her word uh, would, reach, would reach the ears that need to hear it today, God, that you would anoint her with, with your blessing and your words and your teaching that she could share that with us. 
and that would hit home uh, right where it needs to. And now, God, as we continue in our time of worship and singing our praises to you, we, we turn to the words that your son gave to his disciples all those years ago and that millions of other Christians around the world pray together, God, and we take a comfort in, in those words, in, in what, the, what that prayer says, and in that we are joining in the body of Christ. And so together as one voice we pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. King, 
Sing praises to your name. Praises to your name. A name that's so much higher than all names. All honor to. Oh, it 
church finds me your name is love your name is hope inside me hope inside Please bow your heads with me. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we praise you for this opportunity to be together. Lord, we play with all the craziness in the world right now that you are the one thing that every person who hears this message, who watches this, who listens, focuses on you. Lord, I pray for Pastor Julia as she comes to deliver this message. I pray that Every single word that's spoken, every story told, every reading of your word, every illustration she gives brings a person closer to you. If they already know you, fantastic. It brings them even closer. But if they don't know you, I pray that something that she says changes that. Because no one's guaranteed tomorrow. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we praise you. We pray all of these things in your son's most holy name. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. I'm excited to see you uh, through your screen this morning and pray that God is meeting you in a profound way. I wanted to take just a brief moment to highlight a couple things that are coming up in the church that as we have this opportunity to walk together, to live life of uh, lives of faith together, I think might be helpful. Uh, On Tuesday of this week, we are going to begin our grief book study, and that'll be on Tuesday night from 6 to 8. And we're going to be looking at the book, A Grace to Skies. It's not too late to join that group if you're interested in it. And I I need you, if you're interested in doing that, to to buy the book and then read the first two chapters. If you don't have the book but you want to come, just come and you'll catch up. It'll be a a good good opportunity for us to live life together in a really tangible way. And it's, it's such a profound story and wonderful story about a man who loses his family, part of his family, in this tragic event. And that is heartbreaking and discouraging, as you might imagine. But he shows this, this story of how he lives through that and just how God shows up for him in, in really spectacular ways. And that his life is radically transformed, not only through the grief that he experiences, but the ways that God's people come alongside him, the ways that he is transformed through that. 
And I just, I think it's such a, spect- it's just a, such a powerful story of God's work in the midst of difficult seasons. And I wonder if you might be feeling like we're in a bit of a difficult season. Uh, you can do that through, uh, through Zoom. And if you're interested, send me an email and I will do a Zoom call with you as part of that. And, and uh, the others will be invited to come on campus. But it'd be super helpful to me if you'd send me an email or send the church an email or call me and let me know that you're want, wanting to do that so that I could be prepared for that. Uh, that will start uh, Tuesday, the 15th. And then as we're looking forward, as, as Jason prayed so beautifully, this, this desire for all of us to join with Christians all around the world, to be praying for our country, to be praying for God's work in the midst of it. It seems like there's a lot of tough things going on, and there's there's so many strong opinions on every um, corner, and it's certainly important to know why we believe the things we do and, and what God has called us to do. But my hope is that we might be praying intentionally with Christians around the world for God's provision and, and blessing on us, that God would, would unify us and that we would uh, be able to come together in some fashion on the person of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to start that on the 25th, which will be 40 days before the election. And so if you're interested in doing that, we sure would love to have you do that. We'll be joining with Christians around the world. And uh, to do send us an email, and we would love to make sure you're part of that. But it's just an opportunity for, for you and for me to, to come into the presence of the Lord in a different way. That we might be walking with people, we might be praying people, we might be seeing and really looking uh, for how you're at work. That's the whole tenor of this last year, even more so than that, that, that we need to be making a margin. We need to be creating space for the Holy Spirit to do just profound work in our lives. It's not just about being Christians. That is important, but it's about submitting ourselves to the Lord. It's about letting God transform every bit of our life. I want that for me, and I want that for you. I don't want us to settle for anything less than that. And so I invite you to really be praying about that, that God is is inviting you into more transformation, more provision, more grace and mercy. I don't want us to settle for anything less than that. So uh, do do uh, perfectly consider that, dear ones. I think you you will not regret it. So I'm so excited to be here today. It's our last day of our Matthew discussion, and I was reading this story about a young boy who built this model ship. It was a perfect example of this. He glued all the pieces together, and he worked on it for hours. It was perfect. Every detail was, was correct. Every detail was intentional, and he put it in this beautiful glass case. He wouldn't let his brothers play with it or his sister play with it. He wouldn't for sure have it go into the bathtub. He was going to keep it perfect by keeping it safe. It was a perfect example of a model ship. And right about that same time, his parents bought a real boat. You know, this spectacular boat that they could create memories with and weekends sailing out in the harbor. They loved it at first. But it was a lot of work to maintain. At first they used it a lot, and then they used it a little bit less. It was expensive, it was time-consuming, it took a lot of effort. And after a few months, they went to spend a day sailing, and they found barnacles growing underneath it, algae all over it, and a dead motor. See, a real boat is only kept perfect, only kept in shape by being used. See, the two boats worked in opposite ways. The model was kept perfect by, by being kept apart. And the real boat is kept perfect by working exactly as it was created to do. And I wonder if for you and for me, uh, we have a little bit of that reminder in our lives. Sometimes we want to stay back and learn all of our Bible memory and, and, and spend time with Christians and, and, and pray and fast and do all of these things kind of by ourselves in our own little kind of religious bubble. And that will, in fact, keep our faith in some ways perfect. But I wonder if God is calling you, if God is calling me to step out in faith a little bit. If God is calling you and God is calling me to step out in faith, in fact, a lot. That his call to the disciples to go and make disciples of all nations is the call to us today. And that the only way that we can do that well is by getting out from our comfort zone 
that we might do what God has called us to do. That's, in fact, what we've been created to do, is to go and make disciples. So maybe God's calling us to kick off the barnacles, and kick off the algae, that we might go and do what he has called us to do and what we have been created to do. Let's pray together. God, we're grateful for your mercy, and we pray that you'd remind us of your goodness and your provision of your blessing this day. We pray that more and more you would remind us in, in subtle ways and in significant ways that you are who you say you are and that we have been created and called and reconciled for a purpose. We pray, God, that you would hear, that we would hear this word, this word that was given to the disciples so long ago, this word that is given to us today, right now, wherever we are, in the comfort of our homes, in our car, in our workplace, that you are calling us more and more and more to be reminded of who you are and whose we are. So we pray with confidence in the powerful and mighty and holy name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, amen. Our text today is taken from the book of Matthew 28, verses 16 to 20. It's our last week in our study of Matthew where the kingdom of God changes everything. So the Great Commission, hear the words of our Lord. Then the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So these words to the disciples are the same words to us. And he starts off first and foremost, first and foremost, say that three times quickly, first and foremost, saying to the disciples to go. In verse 16, it says, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. Now remember earlier, if you've been reading along with us in Matthew, which I hope you have, Matthew 28, 7, the angel said to the woman at the tomb, go back to the disciples and tell them to go to Galilee. This is just as Jesus had told them. And they're directed to return, not knowing what to expect. Because this is where it all began for them. And here is this new beginning. Can you imagine what they were talking about as they were going? They feel like they had lost everything. Remember, this is after Jesus had been betrayed, after Jesus had been crucified, after Jesus had been resurrected. The hopes and the dreams and their expectations seem lost at the point of his crucifixion. And they're on their way trying to be faithful, even though they're discouraged, even though they're bewildered, trying to see what God has for them next. And they get there, and in verse 17 it says, when they saw him, when they saw Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. So, so they saw him here. Now the other Gospels tell multiple stories of Jesus um, showing himself after he's been resurrected. And they likely had seen him before, but in the story of Matthew, he focuses on these momentous, profound moments, right before he is crucified and right after he is resurrected. And they worshiped him. This phrase is used uh, many times. It's 12 times in the book of Matthew and only two times in the other gospels. So here they worship him. We see this important reminder, and it's a visible snapshot of their posture towards their Messiah. So when they worshipped him, we come together in our contemporary worship and we have a kind of style of worship. You know, and you go into different churches and they have different styles of worship. But this phrase, when they say they worshipped him, they mean that they fell on their knees and then they fell on their face prostrate. They acknowledge that the king is there. They acknowledge that his kingdom is here. They acknowledge this worship. And remember... They're, they're good Orthodox Jews. They don't worship anything other than God. So when, we, when they do that, it's not only their moment of worship and acknowledging that the king is in their midst, but it is a public declaration of who God is in Jesus. It's this picture of faith and commitment. 
And, and so it says that they worshipped him. And then there's this little tag online that says, and, and they, some doubted. And isn't it easy for us to criticize? Like, here is Jesus resurrected. Why do they not get it? But it says they doubted him. And I, for one, love that. It's, it's a really unique word, doubted him. It, it doesn't mean that they didn't believe it. It doesn't mean unbelief, but it's this, this state of hesitancy. It's that belief, but still kind of the nervous energy. And it's a significant word. It's a specific word. It's only used one other time in Scripture, and it's used in Matthew, that story of Peter walking on the water. Remember that, where he took his eyes off the Savior and he looked to the waves. That phrase, and he doubted. So remember, if there's an unusual word that's used, and there's, there's typically a connection, because always God's word is laying a foundation, undergirding for us this understanding of who God is in our life. And so here is this image of the disciples in the midst of the Savior, and they doubt, this momentary hesitancy. And then there's this, this image earlier with Peter, who, who is in the presence of the Savior, but he, he takes his eyes off the Savior and looks at the challenge, and he doubts. And it, it, for, for me in particular, it helps me better understand who I am, that God doesn't expect us or only call people who always have relentless, consistent, steady faith. He, he works in and through people, ordinary people just like you and me, who sometimes get a little hesitant, who sometimes walk away from the Lord, who sometimes betray him. Even then, God continues to use them. And what I, I'm, here to stand, I'm standing here promising you that even if you are doubting God right now, even if you feel far from God, God is calling you and he can use you to even you, even me. Because here in this snapshot, here in this reminder, he's showing that these are ordinary, average, everyday people like you and me who are frail, who are inconsistent, and are, are right on the verge of this great commission, this great call, this great stage of ministry. And it can't be done on their strength alone. This great commission, this great call can't be done on our strength alone. And if that was just it, if it was just, oh, the people doubted, oh, you doubted, oh, the people walked away from God, oh, we walked away from God, that would be a terrible story to tell. And it wouldn't make any difference in our lives. But it doesn't just stop there, dear ones. We know how the story ends. He calls us, he calls you and me, saying, I know that you are weak and inconsistent and fickle, but what does he say in verse 18? Then Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. We see this contrast, the juxtaposition between the disciples who are fickle, just like you and me, and the, the Lord of the universe who has all authority in heaven and on earth. People who don't fully get it and people who, and the Savior, the Lord, who fully understands why he's there. It begins to remind us this totality of God's power and authority. And, and I had forgotten and was reminded again these, this, this grand scope, this grand sweeping statement of God's total power in all areas of his life. These, and just in this little snapshot, the four alls, all authority to make disciples of all nations to obey all that he's commanded, and he will be with us always. There's this connection of God's power in the midst of the disciples' weakness. In that moment when they're so overwhelmed and discouraged, God is so much bigger than that. It is a reminder for you and for me that no matter what is going on, God is there in the midst of it. All authority to make disciples of all nations to obey all that I commanded, and he will be with us always. And there is this shift here where Jesus' Jesus's ministry in Matthew has been marked by his humanity, except for the glimpse of the transfiguration, which was a bit unexpected, but they did not fully understand. And he moves here from their fragility, their inconsistency, their hesitancy, their doubting, to his full authority and power in the midst of that. And consequently, we see that. 
we, we know that, we understand that, and it gives us and hopefully the disciples the assurance to step out in faith. So the disciples are called to go, and we are called to go and make disciples. The challenge is, uh, which was summarized by the late Sam Shoemaker, who was a bishop in the Episcopalian church, that the great commission, he says, of the Lord has called us to be like Peter, fishers of people. But we have turned this commission around so that we have become merely keepers of the aquarium. Occasionally I come to take some of the fish out of your fishable and I put them in mine and you do the same with my fishable. But we're all tending the same fish. And so here God's word for us is to go and make disciples. That's our call. In verse 19 he says, therefore. Remember if you see therefore, there's a little like neon arrow going, okay, this is, what's really, this is where it really gets good. This is where we're supposed to pay attention. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. See, we hear that today, and it doesn't really make much of an effect on us. We go, yes, of course, we're called to go to all areas, to all people that we might bring them back into a relationship with the Lord. But for the Jews, and specifically, this was a mostly Jewish audience, it would have not only been surprising, it would have been downright offensive. Remember, if you were reading in your book of Luke, that Jesus went to the synagogue and he read out of Isaiah 61. You remember where he, he tells them all about the messianic promise and that, that he is there to fulfill that. Everyone is overjoyed. They are so <laughs> delighted. And then he goes on to clarify that the Messiah was there to save the Gentiles, the non-Jews, as well. And they were angered so much that in Luke 4, 28 and 29, it says they sought to kill him. So they want to be uh, the recipients of the Messiah. They've been waiting for the Messiah. But the idea of the, the Gentiles being included in that promise and provision just completely floored them. And it's just more and more a reminder of how God's people miss it when God is revealing himself in his plan and his call to God's people. If you look back on Matthew, as we've been reading through Matthew, there have been uh, these nuggets of truth, this thread that's gone throughout the book of Matthew, laying down this foundation, but they don't get it. They don't fully understand uh, that, that God would be calling them, a mostly Jewish audience, to be, uh, to be offering and to be um, proclaiming the good news to people who were non-Jews. In chapter 1, you remember that Matthew gives the genealogy of the Lord, and he lists three Gentile women, Tamar, Rahab, and Ruth. And you can imagine that if Gentile people are part of the, line the uh, lineage and the genealogy of the Savior, then they might, in fact, be part of God's spiritual family. In chapter 2, the Gentile magi come from afar to worship him, the king of Jews. In chapter 3, John the Baptist is introducing Jesus, and he says, uh, you can't earn this salvation. In chapter 4, Jesus begins his ministry in Galilee, and it says to Galilee of the Gentiles. The people will sit in darkness, have seen a great light. In chapter 5 through 7, we spent some time in that. He makes it clear that the law and the... The bloodline will not save anyone, only the grace of God in the matter of the heart. In chapter 8, there is this story of the centurion's faith. This Gentile servant was sick, and he asked Jesus to heal him. And you remember what he says, I have not found such faith in anyone in Israel. And in chapter 10, he sends out the disciples with the good news, and he continues, I'm sending you out like sheep to be surrounded by wolves and then he continues just a second later you'll be brought before the governors and the kings because of me as a witness to them and the gentiles so he's laying this foundation through god's mercy that the jews would understand that the gentiles are included but they just 
don't get it. God is surprising them in the midst of it. And, and if God's word is written for us and, and valuable for instruction in our lives today, which it absolutely is, I wonder if God is surprising you and calling you to make a disciple of someone that seems completely out of your comfort zone. Even more than that, someone that seems completely offensive. In this time of election, in this time of polarity, I wonder if God might be calling us, Republicans and Democrats, Democrats and Republicans, and everybody in between, is God calling you to go to someone who has a radically different opinion and posture about politics than you do? In this season when we have the COVID ch uh, challenge and, and, and the mask and no mask and what is this, is God calling you to someone who has a radically different position than you do on this? In this time, in this, in this culture of sexual identity, is God calling you to someone who has a radically different posture and lifestyle than you feel is, uh, is, is proper? In this time of gender kind of conversations, is God calling you to someone different than you are? In this time of racial divide, is God calling you to go and make disciples to someone of a different racial ethnic background? I believe that God is calling us to step out because the gospel is everything. It's the whole thing that we're here about. And, and if our gospel doesn't translate, it doesn't go to people who are out of our comfort zone, then we are missing the boat of participating in what God has called us to do. And even more than that, people who are far from God may not ever have an introduction. God is calling us to step out, and he might be surprising you today. He says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This baptizing is a visible sign of an invisible work. It is a proclamation of faith. It is a proclamation of belief. Baptizing in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in that time maybe had a little bit different meaning than it does today. Baptize is sometimes, for, is sometimes translated baptize unto. It means to publicly receive and adopt someone as a lawgiver and a teacher. Remember, the Jews were originally baptized in the name of Moses in 1 Corinthians 10.2. And Paul also asked in 1 Corinthians 1.30, were you baptized in the name of Paul? So to be baptized is to receive in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit means to receive Jesus as the expected Messiah and to submit to him and receive him as a Savior. So he says, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. So it says, teach and then to obey. It's not just this good theology. It's not just this esoteric thought. It's not just this philosophical discourse. But it is more about this life of disciple because the teach and instruct is the same word as disciple, which means a life lived in the submission of the teacher. And so when we hear these reminders to teach them to obey everything that is commanded, that it is an opportunity for us to submit ourselves and to help others submit themselves as well. There's a young salesman who was disappointed about losing a sale, and as he talked with the sales manager, he lamented. I guess it just proves that you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. The manager replied, son, take my advice. Your, your job is not to make him drink. Your job is to make him thirsty. And so it is with us in evangelism. Our lives should be so filled with Jesus Christ that it creates a thirst for the gospel. We are thirsty for the gospel, and that makes other people thirsty for the gospel. And, and we have to, dear ones, take a moment and look at our lives and say, are we thirsty for the gospel? Am I thirsty for the gospel? This promise for the disciple, this call for the disciple is the same promise and the same call for us. 
Go and make disciples, for I am with you always. He says, surely I am with you always to the very end of the day. Remember, surely or truly or verily, verily, those same, that same word, that that is a reminder that there is an important theological foundation coming right after. It's such a comforting reminder. I mean, think about this circle that we see throughout this, this text, and specifically through the book of Matthew. See, the teacher has left them, and, and they had certain expectations of how their life would go, and then Jesus is crucified. And so they feel left. They feel abandoned. They feel alone. Perhaps you feel left and abandoned and alone in some area of your life right now. This promise is for you as well. He says, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. See, it's this full circle because Matthew begins in Matthew 1, this affirmation that Jesus is named Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. So this is a continuation. When Jesus comes to the earth and he says, I am with you. When he goes to heaven, he is with us. It is a promise of God's faithfulness. We say God calls us to go because the kingdom of God changes everything. This kingdom of God, this image of the kingdom of heaven is used 31 times in the gospel of Matthew. It's important. It changes everything. You see, dear ones, we have lives that are different because of the gospel. We have lives that are different because we have come into the presence of the Lord. We have lives that are different because of what Jesus has done for us. And the greatest heartbreak would be to settle for less than that. The greatest disappointment would be to let the people in our lives that we love and even the people that we do not yet know settle for less than a life lived with Jesus Christ. And so my hope and encouragement is for us, wherever we are, that we might in fact be praying about that. And if you have not submitted yourself to the Lord, if you have not chosen to follow Jesus Christ, whether you've been baptized or not, today is the day, the opportunity that you have. You have the opportunity to live a life with Jesus forever. When he says, I am with you always, and we have been looking at how the kingdom of God is near, that changes everything. That changes how we deal with COVID. That changes how we deal with fire. That changes how we deal with relentless heat. That changes how we raise our kids. That changes how we go into school and workplace in this season. That changes everything. It changes the middle of the week and the tough days and the good days. The Lord is with us, and we cannot settle for less than that. We cannot settle for less than that. Do not settle for less than that. And so I have this opportunity, you have this opportunity to resubmit ourselves to the Lord. And when we do that, we can resubmit ourselves to God's call in our lives. My hope is that you will pray every day this week to see where God wants you to go and who God is calling you to. And that when we look, when we begin our next week in 1 Thessalonians and how God is encouraging us, that we would be able to be encouraged knowing that we are doing exactly what God has called us to. We must take a risk. Now, you know the story of the Titanic. The Titanic was sinking when there were three ships in the region. The nearest was a Samson whose crew was involved in illegal hunting. They didn't want to get caught, so they turned away from those who needed rescuing. The next ship was a Californian whose crew was so afraid of sharing the Titanic's fate that they proceeded very cautiously. Perhaps they were annoyed because they had tried to warn the Titanic. And the third ship was the Carpathia, which came as quickly as possible. They risked their own lives and were able to res rescue more than 700 people. God is calling you to go and make disciples of all nations. God is calling you to go and make disciples. If you feel far from God and that's preventing you, step closer to the Lord. 
If you're worried about getting caught up in that, bring people alongside you to help in this, in this ministry. And if you might go with everything that you have and everything that you hope to become, presenting the gospel, think of all the people that you could save. And even more than that, you would participate in that. And God would be pleased and you would better experience it. Let's do that together. Amen? Should we pray together? Let's pray. God, we're grateful for your mercy and the ways that you show yourself to us. We pray that more and more you would remind us of your goodness. For the opportunity we have to give you thanks, we do give you thanks. And we pray, God, that more and more you would use us for your purpose. So it's with confidence and hopefulness we pray all of these things in the powerful and mighty and holy name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. I'm going to enter into our time of giving now, and I also like to add in thankfulness into it as well. However, there are three ways that you can give. You can give via email at www.cccvv.org, or you can text to 84321, enter the dollar amount, and send. Or you can also send mail, old-fashioned way, that way, at... 3870 Alamo Drive, Vacaville, California, 95687. In my devotions this last week, God brought something to me. And I felt him whisper to me that a heart of gratitude hosts a joyful home. And I wrote it in my mirror <laughs> for my girls and I, because it's something that I really, really want to remember every day because it's really easy to fall into the sadness and depression or anger, frustration, whatever, of everything that's going on. But yet our thankfulness will help to remind us that he is always there with us. And then as we give in our tithing and gifts and time, he fills us with the joy and we give with a heart of gratitude versus obligation. And that's how he gives and how he demonstrated as he walked here on life. And so I just, I wanted to share that with you because it, it really hit home with me. <laughs> so thank you for letting me share that. If you would join me in prayer now. Father God, thank you that no matter what may come, that the battle is already won that your promises forever stand and you never fail. You will always see us through for we are your children and your treasure. So as you give, we demonstrate in the same way as your example and we give with a heart of gratitude and thanksgiving and we ask you to take our giving and bless it and let your will be done and let your glory be seen to the ends of the world. We love you. We seek you out. We praise you in Jesus' name. All God's children say, amen.
so glad that you could take a moment to uh, worship with us. We hope that you will continue to um, look for God's call in your life and continue to look for God's provision. Hope that you will join us in our um, opportunities to pray and to gather together as we make a margin on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m., as we have our grief study on Tuesday nights at 6, and, and as we just have opportunities to be uh, coming together around the cross, around God's call in our lives. So I invite you, dear ones, to hear a blessing from um, Halverson. It's a wonderful reminder of God's call in our lives. So hear these words and receive them. You go nowhere by accident. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. God has a purpose in your being there. Christ lives in you and has something he wants to do through you where you are. Believe this and go in the grace and love and power of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen. Have a great week and God bless you. Walking down this road Frail and weak Restless Oh, so restless These desires I don't want to own Lord, I reach out to you You always know I'm calling out to you, come and see me through, hear me now, hear me now, cause this promise I have made, this promise I will see too. You need me to deliver, that's what I will do, cause this promise I have made, this promise I will see too, you need me to deliver, that's what I will do. upon your beloved son I'm with you always with you in weakness your strength and powers to allow your glory to rise you up for all mankind he
me now I'm waiting 